Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for part two of our three-part immuno-oncology series. Today's live broadcast, Advancing Precision Immunotherapy Through Next Generation Sequencing of T-Cell Receptors, Part 1, is presented by Dr. Timothy Looney, Staff Scientist, Bioinformatics, Thermo Fisher Scientific. I'm Christina Jewell of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational webcast is brought to you by LabRoots and sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific. For more information on our sponsor, please visit thermofisher.com. Now let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window, or report your problem by clicking on the Answer Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I'd now like to introduce our presenter, Dr. Timothy Looney. Dr. Looney is an accomplished computational biologist and immunologist with expertise in methods and applications of B and T cell receptor sequencing, including biomarker discovery and assay development. He is currently a staff scientist and informatics lead for immune, immune repertoire sequencing within the clinical sequencing division at Thermo Fisher Scientific. Dr. Looney's interests and specialties are centered around the repertoire analysis for immuno-oncology, autoimmunity, and infectious disease translational research. Dr. Looney, you may now begin your presentation. Great, thank you for that very nice introduction. Um, as, as mentioned, I'm gonna to talk to you today about the sequencing of T cell receptors. And if you tuned in for the previous installment of this webinar series, uh, you, you may have uh, uh, been introduced to our immuno-oncology uh, portfolio. There are four assays within this immuno-oncology portfolio. Uh, the Oncomine Immune Response Research Assay, which is a targeted gene expression uh, profiling assay uh, meant to allow one to understand the tumor microenvironment. There's the Oncomine Tumor Mutation Load Assay for profiling tumor mutation. And then what I will focus on today, T-cell receptor sequencing, in particular, our Oncomine TCR beta LR assay. The LR stands for long read. And uh, in the next installment of this webinar series, I'll discuss the TCR beta SR assay, which is our short read assay uh, compatible with FFPE preserved materials. So to to put everything in context in our, in our um, broader strategy in uh, immuno-oncology, I want to uh, introduce the concept of checkpoint blockade immunotherapy. And this is an incre uh, incredibly exciting development for the treatment of cancer. Uh, checkpoint blockade immunotherapy uh, describes the use of agents that modulate the way in which T cells interact, interact with immune cells and tumor in order to increase T cell killing of tumor. When it works, it's incredible. There's a uh, durable response, and in some cases, uh, an, an individual with cancer is totally cured. What is potentially even more exciting is the notion that one can use uh, these blockade agents in combination to further increase the efficacy of this immunotherapy treatment. So one question is whether or not uh, someone will respond to an immunotherapy. This is, this is something, uh, predicting response is something that is an outstanding question in, in the field. Now, the, despite the, the efficacy and, uh, and uh, excitement with this approach, there is a, a challenge, which is uh, immune-mediated adverse events. And when one receives checkpoint blockade therapy, that can activate T cells to destroy cancer but it can also make those same T cells destroy healthy tissue. And immune-mediated adverse events or immune-related adverse events can affect multiple organ systems and cause permanent damage 
or even death. And what's, what's more is that the incidence of adverse events is elevated in, uh, in combination immunotherapy uh, setting. Thus, the, the therapeutic approach that holds the most promise may also have uh, uh, the greatest challenge in terms of, of toxicity. And to date, there isn't a good way to predict who might have a very bad reaction to immunotherapy and who might receive a uh, checkpoint blockade without a uh, problem. So if, if one could identify biomarkers, predictive biomarkers for adverse events, that would allow for safer and more effective use of immunotherapies, potentially allowing for personalized drug selection and dosing, and ultimately uh, expanded use of the most efficacious combination therapies. So at, at uh, Thermo Fisher, I, uh, you know, I, I want to mention that that we are, we have taken these these questions to heart. We uh, and and much of our work has been focused on identifying predictive biomarkers for adverse events during immunothera immunotherapy, but also predictive biomarkers for response. And in the, the following slides uh, in this webinar, I hope to show you how T cell receptor sequencing of peripheral blood can be used for, to address both of these questions. Now, in terms of the immuno-oncology assay portfolio, uh, this, this portfolio was designed in order to interrogate all aspects of the cancer uh, immunity cycle. And this details the way in which T cells and other immune cells interact with cancer. In the diagram here, you'll note the, uh, at the bottom uh, uh, a visualization of the tumor microenvironment. And in, uh, the, tum the tumor microenvironment is uh, a perfect uh, uh, type of uh, material to interrogate with the Oncomine Immune Response Research Assay, which is a targeted gene expression profiling assay. Tumor may also be profiled using the Oncomine Tumor Mutation Load Assay. And uh, antigen-presenting cells may prime T cells with tumor neoantigen, uh, which may proliferate and then ultimately kill uh, tumor. I'll point, point out to you in this, uh, uh, in this immunity cycle the Oncomine TCR beta LR assay. Uh, it's it's uh, on the peripheral blood portion of, of the immunity cycle. And this assay is really ideal for interrogating T cells within the peripheral blood. These are T cells that may have been primed by tumor neoantigen and proliferated. And so within the periphery, one may detect signatures of T cell responses to tumor. So in this next slide, I'm giving you a little bit more detail in the T cell receptor biology. Uh, the T cell receptor is a heterodimer consisting of a beta chain and an alpha chain, uh, which are produced by VDJ recombination. And during this process, tandemly arranged variable diversity and joining genes recombine to produce a functional receptor. Owing to the combinatorial nature of that process and the action of uh, exonucleotide 2 back at the ends of the V, D, and J junctions and addition of non-templated bases by TDT, the CDR3 region is incredibly diverse. It's so diverse that it can be used to track a T cell over time. Uh, with that said, the CDR1 and 2 regions of the rearranged receptor are also important for determining the antigen specificity of the receptor. And this portion of the receptor is germline encoded. And what I'm going to describe to you uh, in, the, in the later slides is how polymorphism within this germline encoded portion of the variable gene may serve as a biomarker for adverse events. So this slide highlights the assay design of our TCR beta chain sequencing assays. We uh, have developed an LR and SR assay. Uh, LR refers to long read, and it's a long amplicon, and SR, short read, short amplicon, covering the CDR3. Now, the, the CDR3 uh, only assay, the short read assay, uh, owing to that short amplicon length, allows it to be compatible with FFBE preserved material where the nucleic acids may be degraded. 
by contrast, the LR assay, uh, you'll note at the top, util utilizes uh, multiplex primers targeting the framework one region of the, of the variable gene and the constant gene region. So this produces an amplicon of approximately 330 base pairs in length that includes sequencing coverage of all three CDR domains. Not just the CDR3, which can be used to track cells and measure clonal diversity, but also the germline encoded CDR1 and 2 regions of the receptor. Uh, now, both of these assays uh, uh, can be analyzed in Ion Reporter, which is our, uh, software, our, our an, an analysis platform. And this includes a number of uh, uh, analyses that allow one to quickly get a sense of immune repertoire features. Uh, this includes uh, visualizations uh, of the repertoire, which allow one to quickly get a sense of the extent of clonal expansion or diversity. It allow, the, the software allows one to track clones over time, so longitudinal tracking of clones. And uh, I'll, I'll note that uh, the, the data produced by this assay uh, is freely available to customers. You have access to the raw data, and the, this analysis can be run locally on your, uh, on your Ion Reporter uh, uh, server or, on, or cloud. So in, in, uh, apart from the analysis, uh, which is uh, you know uh, a great part of this of, of this tool. We we did a, a lot of work to ensure that the assay is producing uh, accurate and uh, sensitive readout of the clones within a sample. And one way we did this is by creating a set of of uh, references reference rearrangements derived from literature. Here I note. Uh, the, the details of this, of this procedure where we used 30 TCR beta chains uh, derived from T-cell lymphoma cell lines. The 30 uh, that I mentioned were actually used to validate the Biomed 2 uh, TCR beta primer set. We took the sequences of these uh, beta chains, cloned them into plasmids, and then used those plasmids to spike in uh, to our uh, PBL peripheral blood leukocyte backgrounds uh, in order to uh, assess the sensitivity of this assay. Now, in this slide, you'll note the results of that experiment. On the left, I'm showing you uh, the, uh, the results of spiking in those 30 reference rearrangements into a background of cDNA derived from peripheral blood leukocytes and asking whether or not one can detect those reference re rearrangements over a range of input frequencies. And so you'll note that the frequency of these reference rearrangements matches expectation, and the assay can detect uh, rearrangements at, uh, over, a, over a wide range of, of, uh, of, of clonal frequencies. Now on the right, you'll note uh, uh, a complementary experiment to demonstrate the accuracy of this assay. In this experiment, we, we sorted a defined number of T cells extracted all of the RNA uh, from those T cells, and then used that for library preparation. Now, in this case, you don't know the sequence of the rearrangements, but you know the maximum number of rearrangements that one might detect. For example, if one sorts 5,000 T cells, extracts all of the RNA, and then sequences the TCR beta chains, one shouldn't expect this to find far more than 5,000 unique rearrangements. If one did, that might indicate that there are uh, errors or artifactual rearrangements owing to sequencing or PCR error. So what you'll note here is that over uh, three, uh, over a wide range of, of T cell input amount, uh, the assay reports a number of unique rearrangements uh, or clones detected, uh, closely matching what uh, closely matching expectation. So, so now I'm going to switch into the biomarker applications, and I think this is a, this is a, a really exciting uh, portion of the talk. Uh, after, I, after I cover biomarker, I'm going to then discuss uh, applications of this assay to T cell therapy. Now this, this slide highlights uh, 
two important biomarkers that one can uh, obtain from using the TCR beta LR assay on peripheral blood. And you'll note on the left is the results of centrifuging peripheral blood. Uh, you'll note the plasma fraction, the buffy coat, which is where the white blood cells where the T and B cells can be found, and then the erythrocytes. Now, when we typically think about liquid biopsy, we think about sequencing material within the plasma fraction, and the buffy coat may be ignored. Now, what one can do with this assay is extract total RNA from that buffy coat uh, and use that RNA as input for library preparation through the LR assay. And that allows one to do two things, uh, measure TCR convergence, which may be a biomarker of, uh, a predictive biomarker of clinical response, and I'll talk about that more, but also assess variable gene polymorphism. And uh, there's a thought in the literature that polymorphism within the germline encoded portion of the variable gene may uh, be linked to autoimmune disease and potentially toxicity during immunotherapy. So just a reminder of the LR assay and the amplification strategy. As I previously stated, this uses multiplex PCR primers targeting the FR1 region of the variable gene and the constant gene region. That allows one to detect polymorphism within the variable gene, but also assess the CDR3 region. And uh, I'm, I'm highlighting right now the domains of this of this amplicon and how they may be used. Polymorphism within the germline encoded portion and in the CDR3 region is, is uh, essential for measuring TCR convergence, which, re which refers to the phenomenon whereby T, -cells, uh, T cell receptors are identical in amino acid space, but distinct in nucleotide space. So in a typical use case of this assay is uh, 25 nanograms of cDNA derived from peripheral blood total RNA. Uh, sequencing, uh, sequencing the resultant libraries to 1.5 million reads, reads depth, and that turns out to be about eight samples per 530 chip. And I want to mention that the reason we are able to sequence such a long amplicon is, is, is owing to the fact that the Ion Gene Studio S5 530 chip allows for quite long uh, read lengths. Up to, up to 600 base pairs. So this assay is really, uh, you could argue, is enabled by this unique technology that the 530 chip uh, provides. So in the next slides, I'm gonna show you some data demonstrating the, uh, that these two biomarkers uh, may be used to predict response. And the data I, I will present to you uh, uh, is derived from 55 individuals who received checkpoint blockade monotherapy for cancer. They, they received either ipi, uh, ipilimumab, nivolumab, or pem pembrolizumab. Uh, these were almost entirely Caucasian. Uh, 54 were annotated as Caucasians and, and one of uh, unknown ethnicity. And uh, these, uh, the sample was pretreatment peripheral blood, 25 nanograms of cDNA, and the resultant libraries were sequenced to 1.5 million read, uh, reads depth using the S5530 chip. And this, this uh, experiment was performed through a third-party OmniSeq, and the samples derived from Roswell Park Cancer Center. And to the right, I'm showing you a, a breakdown of this, uh, the, the details of this cohort. You'll note that there's a range of cancers, mostly melanoma and adenocarcinoma, but some others. And then at the bottom, repertoire features. Uh, this highlights just the fact that the samples were sequenced, uh, the sequencing quality was good, we received, uh, we obtained about 1.5 million raw reads per library. So to, to talk about this polymorphism concept, I, I also want to bring into uh, discussion the concept of a haplotype. And a haplotype is a set of DNA variations or polymorphisms that tend to be co-inherited. And this can be owing to genetic linkage or population structure. Now, the, the TCR beta locus is a classic example of where one would expect to detect a haplotype uh, uh, type structure because there are polymorphic variable genes which are in close genetic proximity. And 
because this assay allows us to detect all of the variable gene alleles within uh, uh, an individual's repertoire, we can infer the haplotype from the data generated by this assay. And, and thus, we can, act, we can ask whether particular haplotypes are associated with severe adverse events during immunotherapy. And uh, in this slide, I'm highlighting uh, a cartoon example of two different haplotypes where the, uh, uh, the boxes indicate genes, the star indicates different variable gene alleles, and the color indicates what, uh, you know, the, the actual allele. And you'll note that with a haplotype, one expects to see sets of co-inherited or co-incident alleles. So in order to determine the variable gene alleles present in, in an individual, we, uh, it's, it's actually quite straightforward from the standard ion reporter analysis workflow. And after the FR1 uh, framework one constant gene multiplex PCR, there's uh, a sequencing, there's sequencing of the resultant amplicons. There's a step to eliminate PCR and sequencing errors. And this uh, takes advantage of the fact that the ion torrent has a very low substitution error rate. And substitution errors are problematic for immune repertoire studies owing to the fact that they can mimic the natural variation in the repertoire. Uh, after that uh, error elimination step, there's an annotation step where the rearrangements are annotated by comparison to the IMGT database. Now, IMGT database is considered uh, by many to be gold standard, but it's nonetheless thought to be incomplete. And uh, what Thus, when annotating by comparison to the IMGT database, one also has to have a procedure uh, to identify instances where an individual may have an allele that's not in the IMGT database. So that uh, we can really take advantage of this long amplicon approach where the germline encoded portion of the variable gene is included in the, uh, in the amplicon along with the CDR3. And in instances where an individual has an allele that's not in the IMGD database, it will manifest as a plurality of clones having a systematic mismatch to the IMGT database over the variable gene portion. So multiple clones, each with a readily distinguishable CDR3 nucleotide sequence, all having the same uh, mismatch to reference. And we know if, if we observe a plurality of clones, having a mismatch, then that uh, indicates that there must have also been a plurality of unique template molecules uh, representing the, uh, the uh, non-IMGT allele. So in, in looking at this data, in addition to de determining all of the IMGT alleles an individual has, we can also determine instances where there is a non-IMGT allele. So applying this methodology to our 55 individual cohort, we obtain something like this. This heat map on the right uh, indicates the uh, distribution of alleles across individuals. This is a, an allele profile of each individual. Now, in the heat map, each row indicates a different in individual, and each column a different allele. A red tile indicates that an allele was detected in an individual, and a blue tile that it was absent. So you'll note, firstly, that some columns have all uh, red tiles. This is an example of a ubiquitous allele. Everyone in the cohort had that variable gene allele. Now, other, co other columns have mostly blue tiles. This is an example of a rarer uh, allele. Now, you'll also note this box-like structure, this blocks of tiles, red tiles, that tend to be found together. This is a manifestation of the haplotype structure that I mentioned. And on the, on the left, I've uh, subdivided the data into four major haplotype groups based on the patterns of these co-incident uh, uh, variable gene alleles. Now, in the, left, in the next slide, what I'm going to do is project this data into two dimensions using principal component analysis. And then I'm going to overlay that projection with the adverse events annotation of the cohort. And here it is. Uh, you'll note on the right, uh, each, uh, each symbol represents a different individual, 
and each color a different haplotype group. And the, the, the symbol shape indicates the grade of the adverse events from grades one to four. And you'll note the red haplotype group. This group uh, consisted of, uh, makes up about 30% of this Caucasian cohort, and no one in that group had a grade three or higher adverse event. Thus, they appear to be protected from severe adverse events. Now, this could have implications for the way in which, uh, you know, one might, uh, theoretically, one might treat these, these, these people. These, th this haplotype group two may be more amenable to a combination immunotherapy approach where there is higher toxicity. They might have just a very low risk of, of, of uh, toxicity. They also might uh, be able to receive a higher dose of monotherapy agents. And then one can also ask the question whether or not, whether or not uh, this haplotype group two uh, uh, cohort may be uh, at lower risk of chronic autoimmune disease. So uh, certainly, if if you have a question, please write please uh, write it down. Uh, contact our moderator, and we'll we'll um, review these at uh, at the end of the of this uh, webinar. So I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it at this uh, for the haplotype uh, and and polymorphism. The, the one other thing I just want to emphasize is that these haplotypes are germline encoded, so one can assess the uh, the the haplotype of an individual at any point in time. It's not as though one needs to assess it at the time of a toxicity. So in that, in that way, it can potentially serve as a true predictive biomarker for adverse events. Now, the, the, the second concept I mentioned before and I want to discuss in detail is TCR convergence. And this refers to the phenomenon whereby an antigen stimulation event may give rise to T cells, T cell clones, which are identical in amino acid space but different in nucleotide space. And in such instances, we know that T cells arose independently, went through VDJ recombination, and proliferated in response to some common antigen. This is, so this is the, the, what the convergent TCRs refers to. And one of the really interesting things about convergence is that it may preferentially arise owing to chronic antigen stimulation rather than acute but transient antigen challenge. And the, the reasoning is that in uh, chronic antigen stimulation, the pool of T cells that might, that have a chance to be stimulated by the antigen is far greater in, in the context of chronic antigen stimulation than acute uh, but transient antigen stimulation. And for, for that reason, convergence may be a great way uh, to get a sense of the immunogenicity of a tumor and thus the likelihood that it may respond to immunotherapy. So I would just want to give you an example of what a convergent TCR group looks like. Here I'm showing you uh, an example of a convergent group, uh, three clones uh, detected in an individual with melanoma, and this is in the pretreatment peripheral blood of, of, of an individual. And you'll note that these three clones are identical in amino acid space. They have the same variable gene, the same CDR3 amino acid sequence, but the CDR3 nucleotide sequences are different. And they differ uh, at the VD and DJ junctions at the part of the rearrangement that arises owing to exonucleotide chewback and uh, an additional uh, by the, en the enzyme TDT. And if you look carefully at this slide, at the black bases adjacent to the blue and the uh, yellow portion of the CDR3 nucleotide, you'll note that uh, a single base substitution, a, sing a substitution sequencing error, has the potential to create an artifact that resembles a convergent T uh, TCR uh, group. So for this reason, substitution sequencing errors are particularly problematic for the measurements of convergence. And Getting back to ion torrent and, and the advantages of this platform, ion torrent has a very low substitution sequencing error rate, and thus it may be particularly well suited to the measurement of convergence. Now, we have been looking at convergence as a biomarker for some time, but one of the first places we looked was in uh, through, this, uh, through the sequencing of tumor biopsies, 
And here I'm showing one slide from uh, data we presented at AACR of, of this year. And this study involved uh, sequencing of the tumor infiltrating T-cell melanoma. And this, this was using the LR assay, and the, the input samples were fresh frozen tumor biopsies. And one thing we noted is that within the, the, the melanoma infiltrating T-cell repertoire, convergence, uh, we, we found ample evidence of convergent TCRs. Uh, uh, quite, quite different than what we, one observes from the sequencing of peripheral blood from healthy individuals. So one question we then asked was whether convergence might also be detectable in the peripheral blood and whether it could be used as a biomarker to predict response. So now returning to that 55 sample cohort, uh, when we looked at the pretreatment peripheral blood for evidence of convergence, we noted that Indeed, it appears that individuals who go on to have an objective response tend to have a higher frequency of convergent TCRs in the, in the pretreatment peripheral blood than those who do not. And, uh, uh, you know, this, this uh, emphasizes the fact that uh, the, the peripheral blood, uh, T-cells in the peripheral blood, may indeed hold signatures of uh, T-cell responses to tumor and thus can serve as a liquid biopsy type uh, uh, material for uh, predicting immunotherapy response. So in terms of what I just showed you in, uh, with respect to biomarkers for TCR, I talked to you about convergence and uh, prediction of adverse events. Now, one question is how convergence might relate to other biomarkers. For example, tumor mutation burden. And uh, this, this question is interesting. Now, what, now, one can make the argument that, in some ways, tumor mutation burden may be an indirect measurement of the immunogenicity of a tumor, because the somatic mutation must uh, lead to a change in amino acid of an expressed protein, that, that a peptide must be presented by the HLA, and then ultimately has to engender a, a T cell proliferation and, and uh, killing a tumor. So there are many steps that have to occur between the somatic mutation and the T-cell response. But with convergence, we're actually measuring the active agent, which is the, you know, the T-cells the themselves. So there is an argument to be made that potentially something like convergence may be a more direct measurement of tumor immunogenicity. And finally, just to emphasize, the data I showed you from pretreatment peripheral blood allows for both assessments of polymorphism for prediction of adverse events, and convergence. So with a single uh, library, one can do the, uh, uh, address these two important questions. So now switching to the, the, the last section of this talk, T-cell therapy, I'm going to talk to you about ways in which this assay may be used uh, to improve the uh, manufacture and uh, uh, and uh, design of therapeutic T-cells. And the use cases can uh, be subdivided into two major categories highlighted on this slide. First major use case for TCR sequencing in therapeutic T-cell applications is uh, towards the uh, uh, QC, or Manufacturing Quality Control, which allows one to uh, optimize the production of the T cells. Now, the second, uh, the second application is to monitor the activity of the therapeutic T cells once they are introduced into an individual, asking questions like, how, how long do the therapeutic T cells persist? Are they expanding? Uh, these questions can provide insight into the efficacy of a product. So this slide highlights ways in which one can use TCR sequencing during the QC product uh, process. One can, uh, at the very early steps when one is extracting uh, T cells from an individual for in vitro culture, one can assess the repertoire to understand whether it is diverse, whether there are dominating clones. During the in vitro trans, uh, uh, expansion, uh, one can monitor the expansion by assessing the T cell repertoire features, again asking whether or not certain clones are dominating the culture. 
After a viral transduction step or other event that alters the genome of the T cells, it's important to assess whether or not such uh, procedures may have given rise to T cells that are damaged and proliferating uncontrollably. So T cell receptor sequencing is great for that. And then finally, as I mentioned uh, in the previous slide, when those T cells are introduced into an individual, the T cell receptor sequence can be used to track those T cells and ask whether or not they're expanding or whether they uh, uh, are, are no longer found in the individual. So uh, just to, to um, get back to one uh, important uh, measurement of the repertoire, there's something called evenness. And repertoire evenness refers to the extent to which clones are, uh, T cell clones are found in equal proportion. High evenness means that the clones found in a sample are all of similar frequencies, whereas low in evenness indicates that uh, some clones are prefer preferentially expanded. And evenness is also uh, known as normalized Shannon entropy. And for those who you know, use uh, clonality, it's one minus the clonality. So uh, with respect to evenness, uh, you know, one great aspect of this assay is that one can quickly, uh, within a 48-hour turnaround time, assess the repertoire. So start to uh, sample collection to results can be uh, obtained uh, in under 48 hours. So in this experiment, uh, we uh, sought to track the evenness of T cell, therapeutic uh, T cells uh, as part of a research study. Uh, these T cells were derived from peripheral blood mono, uh, mononuclear cells. Uh, they were extracted and expanded in vitro using uh, Dyna beads, anti-CD3, CD28 beads, and CTS optimizer. So this, these were expanded over a 10-day time course, and over the, the course of this in vitro expansion, we asked whether or not the evenness of clones uh, changed. And in this type of experiment, one would hope to elicit a polyclonal T cell expansion, where no one clone is dominating the, the, the culture. And indeed, for two donors, uh, so two separate T cell starting materials, we note a consistent increase in the evenness of the T cells over time. So this, this highlights the fact that this approach with anti-CD3, CD28 bead stimulation uh, and this uh, optimizer media uh, really promotes polyclonal or unbiased T cell expansion. Now, in this, uh, this last uh, uh, vignette, I, I want to mention uh, one way in, in which this assay was used uh, to provide insight uh, into uh, a, an adopted T-cell transfer therapy. Now, the experiment I'm going to describe to you was presented by uh, Dr. N uh, Noel Miranda, and in, in this, uh, this study, uh, an individual with cancer uh, uh, there was a tumor extracted to create a tumor cell line, and T cells extracted from this individual were co-cultured with the tumor. Uh, the, the, the goal there is to elicit the, or stimulate the, product, the, the proliferation of T cells that are, uh, that are recognizing tumor antigen. After this in vitro stimulation of those T cells, the, the resultant product is infused back into the individual with, with the goal of uh, um, eliciting an anti-cancer response. So the, the individual in question had stage four melanoma and uh, previously received adoptive T-cell transfer and lived for 11 years. But uh, the cancer uh, returned and Dr. Miranda had to decide on one of two cell therapy products to give this individual. And at that time, they didn't use T-cell receptor sequencing to uh, assess the quality of those cells. And so he uh, you know, really had to blindly choose which of two uh, products to use. And you, know, you can ask yourself, now retrospectively, he went back and asked, what, was it, what of those two products, what, were, uh, you know, what did the repertoires look like? And on the left, uh, you know, the, the two, uh, Cell therapy products are, are indicated on the slide till 1207 and 1209. You'll note that there are uh, quite 
striking differences in the level of T-cell expansion within these two products. Uh, the, the plots on this slide are spectrotyping plots which highlight clonal expansion, and they're taken directly from Ion Reporter. You'll note this O7 culture on the left contains two large circles indicating two large clones that are dominating that uh, T-cell product, whereas the one on the right, many circles, a diverse uh, product with many unique TCRs. Now, not knowing which uh, 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 the, the diversity of these samples, he chose the O7, and uh, unfortunately, that, that uh, individual had a negative outcome. And uh, you know, his argument, and which, which uh, you know, makes a lot of sense, is that uh, perhaps a, the 1209 would have been a better choice because it's more diverse, and thus there are a greater number of TCRs that could recognize a greater number of tumor antigens. So this highlights the way in which uh, this TCR sequencing approach can be used to improve or uh, understand uh, therapeutic T-cell applications. So with that, I, I want to finish and uh, just summarize what I told you in this, uh, in this webinar. I talked to you about the, the, the Ion Gene Studio S5 system and how aspects of that sequencer, uh, the Ion Torrent, uh, really uh, uh, are, are well suited for immune repertoire sequencing applications namely the low substitution error rate, long read capability, and fast turnaround time of this, of this platform. I told you how long amplicon sequencing of beta chains from pretreatment peripheral blood allows for interrogation of polymorphism and also convergence to potentially predict response to immunotherapy and toxicity. And then I finally talked to you about ways in which that fast turnaround time and low input requirements allow the uh, uh, TCR beta LR assay to be used uh, for therapeutic T-cell applications. So, so with that, uh, I think uh, we can turn to questions in the audience, and uh, I really thank you for taking the time to listen to me. Thank you, Dr. Looney, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. Again, if you have a question you would like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the answer question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll try to answer as many questions as we have time for. Okay, let's get started. Dr. Looney, our first question is, how does the mutation rate of CA cells affect TCR convergence? Could you, could you, um... Of, of CA cells, could you help me understand what, uh, better understand that, that term? No, nope, let's, um, Stephen, you've submitted this question. Would you mind submitting your question again with a little more elaboration on what you're asking for? We'll go ahead and skip this question and hopefully Stephen will submit um, a more detailed question for you. Let's go to our next question. Okay, Dr. Looney? Do you see convergent TCRB signatures in PBL also in acute or chronic immune activation or disease? Great question. You know, this is something that we're actively exploring at this time. Uh, from, from the data we've collected, it does appear that one can detect some level of, convergent, of, of TCR convergence in, in uh, peripheral blood of healthy individuals, but it's typically less than 1%. Of, of the total of the total sequences. Now, in terms of chronic uh, autoimmune disease, this is a great this is a great question, and one could hypothesize that convergence in this situation may be elevated. We don't know yet, but that's that's a great question uh, and something that could be explored further. Okay, we're going to go back to Stephen's question. Um, how does the mutation rate of cancer cells affect TCR convergence? Oh, great. This is, you know, very, thanks, Stephen. That's a great question. What, and I think that, you know, the broader question is how does, uh, you know, somatic mutation or the, or the neoantigen load of the tumor correlate with convergence? We don't, we don't know yet. That's a great experiment. One could assess tumor mutation burden and ask whether or not it correlates with uh, the extent of TCR convergence in peripheral blood. 
that's a, it's a it's a really nice uh, question, and it, w it would be a great experiment. Okay, our next question, Dr. Looney, how can you accurately measure evenness or clinical expansion when starting from RNA? Every cell potentially has a different copy count. Thanks. You know this. Is this is a great question, and uh, you know this is something that I think is talked about in in the field, uh, the repertoire field, quite a bit. What are the advantages of RNA versus versus DNA? Now, DNA, you know, it has to have one uh, rearrangement copy per cell, whereas the RNA theoretically could, could have a different level of, of expression. Now, this question, I uh, I would say, is most pertinent to B cells, where the expression of the B cell receptor. Uh, can vary tremendously de depending on the B cell type. For example, memory B cell uh, compared to plasma blast compared to pl plasma cell, the expression of the B cell receptor can vary uh, considerably. And so that's something that one would uh, need to take into account when looking at, at uh, B cell receptors, given that a plasma blast or a plasma cell may have an outsized contribution to the RNA pool. Now, with with T cells, it, uh, there's really not, to my understanding, uh, indication that different T cell subtypes have markedly different levels of uh, expression of the T cell receptor. So that, that type of issue isn't as, uh, as pressing for, for uh, T cell studies. And uh, you know, the other thing I want to mention, which is a really nice aspect of the RNA approach, is that one can use a, a quite, quite a bit smaller amount of starting material in order to survey an equivalent number of T cell receptors that one would uh, uh, be able to capture through a gDNA-based approach. And that's because the RNA is already enriched for the target, the T cell receptor beta. So that's, you know, I, I would just mention that's a really, really nice advantage of using RNA for this type of uh, experiment. Um, now, Dr. Looney, is this assay for liquid-based samples only, or can we use FFPE also? Yeah, this the LR assay is not uh, recommend. It's it's not designed for FFPE, owing to the fact that the template molecules with the uh, uh, are often uh, truncated. They're degraded owing to the FFPE preservation. So this is for. Uh, uh, the ideal sample types for this uh, LR assay are peripheral blood, peripheral blood leukocytes, you know, whole blood, uh, cultured T cells, and any fresh frozen biopsies. Uh, so really, anything that is not FFPE preserved. Now, Dr. Looney, this um, question next. Uh, are you confident that TCRB signatures reflect the associated TCRA signatures that are not sequenced in the assay, given the preferential responsiveness of TCRB signals to exogenesis or endogenesis superantigen? You know, I, I, I want to uh, mention, yeah, that, that's great. It's a great question. I think that, you know, one of the, the, the the points that this this question addresses is, um, you know, what does what does the alpha chain have uh, to to contribute to this? Uh, you know, one question in the in in the field is, you know, what proportion of TCRs are beta chain dominant? And that that refers to uh, beta uh, T cell receptors where uh, the antigen specificity of the of the receptor uh, is uh, wholly dictated by the beta chain with the alpha chain having really more, more of, a, of a stabilization role. So in, in terms of uh, the role of the alpha, uh, the alpha chain, uh, that's not something we sequence in, uh, in this assay. This is, this is a beta chain sequencing. But one could uh, make the argument that uh, perhaps even a majority of, of TCRs are beta chain dominant, where uh, any alpha chain paired with the, the beta chain uh, would confer the same antigen specificity. Okay, our next question. We have so many great questions coming in. Let's go with this one. Um, 
Dr. Looney, a follow-up to the RNA versus DNA question. Would you use RT-PCA, I'm sorry, would you use RT-PCR convergence if you felt RNA was easier to use for T and B cell studies? Um, would, would I use RT-PCR convergence? I, I think I'm still a little bit unsure of the, that the meaning of that term. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned that RNA in general is, I would say, is a great, it's a, really a preferential uh, source of input material, owing to the fact that one can use a small amount of the material to survey a great number of T cells. So I, you know, the, the other thing is that it's, uh, uh, it's easy to obtain RNA usually in, uh, from, from most samples and uh, it, the other the other benefit to using the RNA is that one will only sequence productive rearrangements. So the, uh, in some cases, T cells can have a productive, uh, productively rearranged TCR beta and also an unproductive. And with RNA, it, it, uh, one will exclusively sequence the productive rearrangements. So I don't know if I have addressed that question, but if there's if the if the, uh, the asker would like to follow up with a little bit more detail of the RT PCR, I'd be happy to answer. Excellent. Now we have time for a few more questions. We'll try to get a couple more in. Uh, let's go with, here we go. Uh, Dr. Louis, what is the read length of this assay? Yeah, the, the amplicon length is 330 base pairs, and that covers the CDR 1, 2, and 3. Uh, and, and this is uh, obtained using framework 1 and constant gene targeting primers. Now the assay, the, the, those amplicons are sequenced with the S5-530 chip, and that that chip has an up to 600 base pair sequencing length. So it's ample uh, uh, ability to sequence through this entire 330 on average base pair amplicon. Okay, and Dr. Looney, we have time for one more question. Is this assay only compatible with the ION-530 chip? No, that's and that that's a good question because it's the really it's 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 essential for the long read lengths, but the 520 and the 510 are also uh, certainly c can be used. And the the difference between those chips is just the output. So in for for um, you know the experiments I showed you, we used the 530 uh, that allows one to tip for typical use cases to have eight samples multiplexed per chip at a level of 1.5 million raw reads. Uh, but certainly you could use those other chips. Thank you, Dr. Looney, for your time today. Um, we would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Dr. Looney, would you like to leave us with any final comments? Yeah, I, I would. I'll, I'll just mention that today I talked to you about the LR assay, but in the upcoming webinar, we will focus on ap applications of our SR short read assay, CDR3 only, which allows for interrogation of FFPE treated material. It's going to be really nice. We'll have some some exciting data to show you, and I uh, would love to have you there for the for the next installment. Thank you, Dr. Looney. Now, before we go, I'd like to thank our audience for joining us today and for your in interesting questions. Now, any questions we did not have time for or those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by Dr. Looney via the contact information you provided at the time of your registration. At the end of this webinar, you will be redirected to the registration page for our third webinar in our three-part immuno-oncology series titled Advancing Precision Immunotherapy Through Next Generation Sequencing of T-Cell Receptors presented again by Dr. Timothy Looney. This live webinar is on September 12th at 8 a.m. Pacific time. This webcast can be viewed on demand through February of 2019. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. We hope to see you on September 12th. Until next time, goodbye.